welcome everybody to uh, this new uh, Bantane Alumni Association webinar. Uh, we have these webinars uh, every month, as you know already. Uh, thank you to Professor Yoko Kato, who uh, is here with us. And I want to welcome also Dr. Ishu Bishnoi, who is my uh, co-moderator uh, today. Uh, I can see also Raja Krishnankuti, who is a, a really important member for the organization of these and other webinars. And I see uh, many other uh, members of our association connected. So welcome everyone. And we can, I think, move on uh, with the second lecture um, issue. Uh, I, yeah, you can, you can talk. Now, um, so second lecture, I, I will invite our dear friend, Dr. Liu Bun Sang. Uh, currently, he is working as consultant at Hospital Sungai, below Malaysia. He was a fellow in cerebrovascular neurosurgery from Fujita University at Bantane Hospital in 2018, and he is uh, also a, a co-editor of ACNS and uh, co-organizer of ACNS Educational Committee and he has also done fellowship in spine surgery and he has published around 15 papers and today he will speak about basic neurosurgical procedures, concepts, techniques, tips and tricks with lessons learned from complications. So I would like to invite Dr. Liu Bun Sang to present his lecture. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Professor uh, Yoko Kato uh, for this opportunity. Yeah, this is not a real uh, lecture, it's just a sharing experience. Uh, uh, it's a quite basic, it's, uh, it's supposed to be a relaxing uh, 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 sharing. Uh, I start by uh, slide. Uh, so I actually uh, accumulate certain uh, cases my experience over the past uh, 20 years uh, is many of the basic uh, things that I think is uh, valuable to be shared here. Uh, so uh, these are the, the common thing that we see in our daily practice, especially in the Asia region where we have a lot of uh, head injury. So I start with uh, these are the topic that we want to discuss over the past 15 minutes, uh, next 15 minutes. And I will start with scalp bleeding. Uh, I had a case, this is a very early stage of my career where, where uh, I was told by the ED physician, a patient with a cerebral concussion, they coming to my ward and uh, I was, uh, this is an assault case. So I was, uh, as usual, asked to be admitted to the ward. And uh, when I saw this patient, uh, despite a full glass coma scale, comatose while in the ward, and I found there's a lot of bleeding over the scalp. Uh, sometimes uh, I feel that uh, we, these are something that very neglected by most people. Uh, we can have excessive bleeding from the scalp if we're not be attended despite a normal CT brain. Uh, EVD uh, again is, is, is again uh, is the most common procedure that we perform, and uh, most of the time that uh, we only been told not to do more than three times uh, uh, for each uh, person, uh, but we do not know how many person can be done. <laughs> But anyway, our aim is to, to drain the CSF. However, uh, it, over the years, I put in, especially in, I'm talking about frontal EVD in the coaches point, should not be inserted more than seven centimeter. You think that you need to insert more than seven centimeter, then you definitely need to reinsert. Uh, even you you have managed to drain the CSF because uh, most most of the time when you're able to drain the CSF with a, a depth of uh, more than seven centimeter, you may be draining from uh, pre pontine space or in the supracellular system. Uh, uh, and, and this is actually very dangerous. And in my opinion, EVD for over the coaches point should not be inserted more than six centimeter uh, for a safety reason. And uh, over the years or so, I found that uh, distorted anatomy uh, when we plan to put in the external ventricular drain, especially in trauma injury. And I find that the best way to put in the EVD is before we make any changes to the uh, imaging that we got. Uh, and usually, for example, like in this case, there's a thick subdural 
and uh, most time you see that the uh, lateral ventricle will be uh, compressed and the slight dilatation of contralateral ventricle despite raised intracranial pressure. And this is actually a best uh, uh, position for us to put in the intraventricular drain. Uh, as, as, as because of distortion, we can't use the normal uh, formula that we use, uh, I mean, uh, go to the uh, contralateral uh, media canters, you know, pointing to the external auditorium meters. So uh, I always attempt to put in a external ventricular drain first before I do the decompression craniotomy. But in this case, I did also show a picture of uh, EVD inserted uh, after decompression. And uh, most of the time, if you have done a good decompression, you may follow the general rule uh, set up to put in the uh, external ventricular drain. Uh, and, and as, as you see here, uh, there's injury over the left frontal uh, 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 brain, and you can actually see from the image uh, uh, quite a dilated uh, ventricle. And, and you can actually immediately reduce the intracranial pressure by inserting the external ventricle drain before you proceed with any form of decompression uh, uh, craniotomy. And, uh, and, and sometimes we think that a big ventricle, uh, we doesn't really need to do a steel, use a steel. And I think most of the time, there are some practices where we actually connected uh, both uh, actually uh, a ventricular drain to the reservoir or, or the omaya. And uh, we think that ventricle is big, so there's no chance that we miss the ventricle. Uh, but I would like to uh, emphasize that because of position of the head, uh, we, we still need to use a steel. Uh, why? I show you a very good example. In this case, we did not use the steel. And because of gravity, the tip of the uh, uh, ventricular end of the catheter tend to fall uh, uh, by gravity. So we, we be high chance you may have a miss uh, uh, placement of the EVD. So always, uh, uh, always try to use your sealant to, to make a proper uh, trajectory of your uh, EVD or ventricular catheter insertion. And you can avoid uh, this, uh, um, um, uh, we call it malposition of uh, ventricular catheter. And again, <clears throat> sometimes big, big space uh, doesn't mean that we can best place to put a, a drainage. And a good example uh, is, is in this case uh, where, where there's no uh, brain prime karma to so called tamponade to reduce the risk of uh, CSF uh, leakage around the uh, shunt site. And, uh, and in this case, we, we have performed a frontal shunt uh, and, and, and that to reduce the risk of uh, any CSF leakage around the subgalar uh, space. Uh, again, uh, this is a very common uh, occurrence uh, where the, the wrong trajectory of the shunt uh, can blame anybody because uh, uh, shunt again is a uh, so called, sorry, uh, is, is it's a blind uh, procedure, and uh, usually uh, there are many new new tools now we have. Uh, but again, it's, it's very expensive uh, to use. Uh, as for example, like uh, having an image guided system, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, that's a very common. Another common thing that uh, always happen, especially in pediatric age, is we tend to over drain the uh, ventricular, and and because we are very happy, we manage to uh, carry the ventricle. We let the cells to flow. Uh, freely. There's two disadvantages to allow CSF to flow freely at the first instances because uh, you may cause, cause sudden uh, lowering of intracranial pressure and unnecessarily cause uh, acute or subdural uh, hemorrhage. Uh, secondly, is we, we, we find the difficult to test the functionality of the uh, shunt catheter, uh, especially when we, after we connect to the peritoneal catheter, uh, very difficult for us to know whether the CSF will flow uh, spontaneously uh, by gravity. Uh, if we excessively allow the CSF to be uh, drained before we have connected the whole system. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, quite uh, common, especially in the neonate. Uh, uh, another, another issue about shun in uh, pediatric is uh, sometimes uh, we need to, to, to see whether uh, uh, two things. One is whether the head are very big and with a small abdomen or the skin are thin. Uh, because again, I think there are many, I think most of us have experienced uh, the shunt uh, cause erosion of the skin. 
and and in this this sort of case uh, we actually have uh, not much uh, option but there are cases that you, where where especially in nonet where the 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 uh, suture have not fused uh, sometime uh, or very thin skin or very small uh, birth weight especially in premature child uh, i i always feel that uh, omaya uh, shan would be a better option uh, until the the child grow bigger with a thicker skin and uh, probably uh, another option is uh, by endoscopic uh, third ventricular stomy uh, we we can discuss about this whether uh, it's, it's a good option or not <clears throat> and uh, again uh, many many instances there are cases uh, this case i saw it uh, many years back uh, during my uh, resident time uh, where we, we first we saw a large ventricle but the child is asymptomatic and this is actually a case of listen kefali that uh, we actually did not actually, uh, perform any uh, CSF drainage in this case. And the most uh, worst uh, experience that I have uh, with the shunt insertion is uh, abscess formation. And uh, this, this definitely is uh, devastating. And uh, when, when ventricular become loculated, uh, then it become even more difficult to treat. And uh, again, and, and because of that, sometimes we may need to have uh, multiple uh, strand insertion uh, despite uh, uh, endoscopic uh, fenestration have been performed. It's not always uh, that successful, uh, same with the, the case of uh, uh, arenoid cyst. And next, I would touch a bit about uh, cranotomy. Uh, again, this is the most important things that uh, we always discuss where we do not open uh, big enough uh, the brain herniating through a small opening, and, and this is called, can cause uh, more damage to the brain. And uh, another always a biggest mistake if uh, we, 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 we actually uh, following the external sign of injury and it doesn't this case the hematoma or the scalp actually is more posterior than the actual location of the extra dura. So to master the imaging and to able to localize uh, uh, the clot are very important. And uh, very much uh, we don't discuss this much but over the years, I find that uh, PCA infarction uh, after uh, uh, unilateral lesion uh, that failed to be uh, tackled or be managed uh, as soon as possible and we cause uh, uh, compression to the PCA and cause a PCA infarction. And this is actually a marker of a delay uh, surgery and uh, this can be avoided. And uh, again, uh, we used to to understand that you no know, certain things that can do faster by doing a linear incision uh, rather than doing a trauma flap. Uh, but the difficulty is if when we want to do a cranioplasty, uh, I, I had one this case that we I find very difficult to put, put in the bone flap, replace the bone flap with this kind of incision. And again, uh, uh, very important, we, we, we always understand that, especially we want to put a uh, uh, frame or, uh, or, or pin towards the bone, we always uh, very careful and not to put in the squamous part of the temporal bone, especially when we use a uh, Hassan brace where we are when at the time when the cranotomy are not working. So it can cause penetrating brain injury. And also, again, uh, sometimes we always tell ourselves to do a generous uh, cranotomy, but we can do generous cranotomy in all areas except the midline. And once you got uh, excessive bleeding from the sagittal sinus or venous leg around that, uh, you may cause more disaster, especially in trauma surgery. And uh, again, <clears throat> uh, there are there are many discussion whether to expose the 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 sinus or not to expose the sinus. Uh, uh, previously, people do not expose the sinus and and uh, do not cut directly cranotomy over the sinus, uh, worrying of uh, injury to the sinus, and uh, and. You actually can do uh, two two bone pieces, and and I think the new trend now people also try to avoid opening the sinus uh, for paras parasagittal uh, lesion or Fox uh, lesion, and also infection uh, infection uh, uh, in in the midline. Uh, Sometimes doing minimum uh, may be better for the patient. Like in this case, we just bring uh, uh, whatever past collection uh, over the uh, subcalar and treat it with antibiotic. Uh, rather than the, doing a cranotomy over the midline sinus and cause more disaster. And again, uh, during my young time, uh, I do not understand this much. Uh, always, especially in trauma surgery, 
we tend to do things fast. We thought we want to help the patient faster. Uh, over the years, I think that uh, trauma surgery and uh, elective uh, cranial uh, surgery are all the same. Hemostasis must be the most important thing to be secure uh, in all surgery. Otherwise, we have this kind of uh, complications. And uh, again, uh, this is just to show that uh, many wrong things can happen. Uh, this is something that you know, people don't do anymore to do a skin incision over the forehead and uh, with uh, residual uh, hematoma or recollection of the hematoma. And again, uh, this is also another uh, common problem in uh, neurosurgery is uh, a, a wrong uh, skin flap being uh, selected uh, for, for a lesion, especially in a hypertensive uh, hep bleed or in a trauma uh, where the localization and as, as a result of this, uh, the surgeon unable to uh, evacuate the clot and uh, re-surgery uh, is warranted in this case. And again, uh, I do not know, uh, but now my practice, uh, I do, don't do a very large uh, decompressive craniotomy. I think we used to, to uh, understand that uh, decompressive craniotomy should involve frontal, temporal, parietal, and hospital bone. And, and I always find that uh, because of the uh, patient condition and uh, when the patient always lying uh, flat, the chance of getting a flat uh, uh, wound breakdown is very high. So in, in current practice, I only do uh, a craniotomy just, just uh, uh, beyond the, the prior eminence and not too posterior. And also, uh, this is something that over years, I try to look into this. I find that uh, this classical teaching telling us to do a perpendicular craniotomy uh, may not be the best option if you can do uh, differently because uh, if you do a perpendicular opening, uh, there's a high chance if you're unable to secure the bone uh, tightly, the high chance the, uh, the atmosphere pressure will push the bone inward and cause uh, unnecessary to raise central cranial pressure. Uh, it's better to do a angulated uh, craniotomy. In that case, there's no chance the bone can be, uh, I mean, displaced in the and of course, unnecessary uh, uh, raise in drug cranial pressure. And uh, uh, this is just to show some, illustrate some of uh, my cases that we do uh, angle, uh, ang angulated uh, cranotomy. The advantage of this is we may accidentally cut the dura. And, 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 and in this case, it's very easy for us to able to retrieve the edge of the dura by just rendering the inner table. And, and we can do a proper dura plastic uh, in what, all cases. And uh, for let uh, I hear and uh, usually uh, sometimes we will may not be able to find the bleeders uh, because it's a venous type. Uh, but in case that we uh, sometimes it may uh, happen uh, together with the burst loop, so uh, sometimes you may have uh, some small cortical bleeding that needs to be secured. And and in cases that brain, if a brain is sunken, I always do a dura tenting, even though in an acute subdural uh, condition. And uh, yeah, this is just example. And I find that the, the, in trauma surgery, uh, frontal and temporal decompression are the most essential. Uh, so you must do a generous uh, opening of the frontal and temporal pole and uh, do a, a generous facial neuroplasty in those areas rather than any other area uh, for a proper decompression. Uh, another uh, thing that I would like to share is uh, to, to do a cruciate incision uh, over the dura for evacuation of hematoma in trauma. And uh, sometimes we are very lucky. We have enough time to Sometimes the brain herniating too fast uh, and we are not able to uh, do a proper dura plasty. In this case, uh, the problem is the brain will herniating through the sharp edges of the bone and this can cause more brain damage. So in those cases that I think um, brain swelling, especially when the subdural thickness is less than the midline shift, I think the edema are more superior than the subdural itself. I usually we try to perform a partial dura plasty first. Uh, so in that case, when I close the dura, I just need to close another two edges. And, and this is uh, give us a better, uh, uh, more, more uh, additional, uh, dura or uh, fascia to be able to do a proper dura closure. And a subdura drain, again, uh, I find the classical teaching teaching us to do a perpendicular burr hole uh, may not so correct for when you want to replace a, a subdural drain. 
uh, because if you put a perpendicular burr hole, the subdural will follow the direction, and this is where we commonly see the brain, uh, I mean, the, the catheter uh, cat, I mean, uh, uh, was inserted inside the brain parenchyma. And I would propose that uh, for subdural uh, uh, drainage, we, we also should do an uh, uh, angulated uh, burr hole. And this is why, because the catheter will be able to direct uh, on the brain surface rather than penetrating inside the brain surface. And this is just to illustrate some of my uh, previous cases where I try to do uh, this kind of a hole and uh, to reduce the risk of penetrating uh, brain injury due to the subdural catheter insertion. This is another example. And again, uh, this is a, a, a case of a, a, a hematoma. And, and most, most of the time, I, my personal opinion is uh, sometimes we do not know what is the best timing to evacuate a hypertensive hematoma. In trauma, we do know because whenever we have a sizable hematoma, we will immediately uh, do our surgery. But in hypertensive, sometimes patient may be uh, appear, especially in elderly, a good Glasgow coma scale, and we think that the surgery may be more harmful to the patient. But there are conditions that where we delay, uh, delay surgery with a large hematoma, we will tend to get a delay brain edema. And in many okay, occasions that uh, intraoperatively, I find the brain is very lax, I able to put back the bone, but because a large hematoma before this or, or uh, due to a delay surgery, I tend to have a quite bad uh, edema and subsequently I need to remove the bone flap. So sometimes this is uh, what, where we should uh, uh, consider, uh, especially those who come very poor conscious level and delay surgery uh, and uh, the hematoma itself may, may cause a lot of uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 injury to the brain and cause uh, delay brain uh, edema. And this, this is also another uh, example of uh, where the brain uh, swelling happened after the re after replacement of bone where we need to remove back the bone flap. And uh, next thing I want to share is, is a sunken flap. Is, uh, what, what type of uh, subgalate brain that we should put inside? Uh, because uh, generally uh, we put a vacuum uh, uh, subgalar drain, but in this case, actually, it's very dangerous to do a vacuum uh, subgalar drain post operatively because you will tend to create a, a, a negative pressure within the cranium and you can actually uh, unnecessarily cause a shift in all the structure and especially tearing the awareness structure. So, in this kind of cases, I usually I just put a passive drain until the patient is fully conscious, uh, reverse from a general anesthesia before. I gradually uh, increase the suction over the ready wet uh, to avoid unnecessary collection of the fluid. Uh, so I do not know what's the experience of other uh, colleagues. Uh, I find this is something very important for us to understand uh, compared to other cases. And uh, this is just the normal thing that uh, preservation of when because we we now we more the more we, we do things we understand that the venous structure are very important to be preserved in all surgery. Uh, uh, not only the arterial structure. So these are things that I would like to share. I hope uh, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, useful to all uh, uh, of you and uh, uh, open for comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for the nice presentation. So now I would like all the audiences to ask any questions or queries from Dr. Liu. It was nice presentation, very correlating. Uh, Ishu, I, can I ask one question? Yeah, sure, sir, please. Yeah, Dr. Liu, actually you have showed some pictures where you were doing EVD for decompressive, uh, I mean EVD in decompressive craniectomy patients. Do you still practice it now? That was in 2006 or 2007, the images which you showed, but do you still do EVD for the cases where do we, you are doing decompressive craniectomy? In trauma uh, patients, still now. Yeah, no. uh, uh, there's yes, uh, there's two two reason for me to put in a EV in a trauma case. Uh, one, if especially those who requiring uh, intra uh, intracranial pressure monitoring, uh, or those who need to be uh, several protected after the surgery. Another another important uh, uh, reason that I put in the EVD, especially those uh, associated with uh, diffuse vascular injury. Uh, sometimes patient may have a diffuse uh, 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 subrenal hemorrhage or intraventricular hemorrhage. It may not 
uh, large enough to cause uh, uh, hydrocephalus, but I do feel that uh, it's best to drain uh, those blood uh, uh, to avoid the, the risk of uh, requiring a, a shunt or CSF diversion later. And uh, mainly for these two reasons, uh, if I'm going to put in the external ventricular drain for the compressive cranky cases. Yeah, because I agree with the ICP monitoring thing, but for uh, CSF diversion, what we are actually following now is uh, Professor uh, Ipcharian's technique of uh, cisternostomy. Cisternostomy, uh, we use a microscope even for trauma cases and also for stroke cases. And we are doing cisternostomy and if needed, we are putting a catheter there in the supracellular cistern. So we have seen good results with this technique actually, uh, following Dr. Ipcharian's technique. That's just my suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. I have one question, if I may. Yes, Professor. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for your, this very complete and interesting uh, presentation. You, you mentioned the problem of the EVD in trauma and the fact that the craniectomy can change the anatomy and things can change. Where do you prefer uh, to place your EVD? My question is very simple, but sometimes I think it's important for the audience. Do you yeah. place your EVD on the same side where you are planning to do your craniectomy or when you have done your craniectomy or on the contralateral uh, ventricle? Okay, uh, uh, my, my preference is, uh, is to do a contralateral uh, ventricostomy, uh, but I would prefer to do that first. So I usually we incorporate the, the flap of the trauma flap, opposite trauma flap to the EVD uh, position of a contralateral because I find that uh, uh, that gives me the best idea where is the ventricle is located. And usually we don't point immediately. We point uh, uh, exactly perpendicular because of the shift. And I find uh, that is the best image that I can get uh, to tell me uh, ventricle. and. Uh, and in this case, uh, usually the contralateral ventricle will be more dilated. So it's more chance for me to cannulate. In cases that I think that, you know, uh, I, I, I think that ventricle is not big enough, by draining the CSF will not help much to uh, immediately reduce the intracranial pressure uh, where I need to do a fast uh, decompressive craniotomy. In those cases, I will only put in the intraventricular uh, drainage after a proper decompressive craniotomy because by hoping that uh, the IFC lateral ventricular safe uh, insertion of uh, uh, external ventricularly, uh, IFC laterally, Professor. Thank you, Liu. I, I, I also have a question. You mentioned about uh, your technique of uh, starting uh, suturing dura in acute subdural before duraltomy. Uh, my question is, uh, in, in this way, aren't you worried to delay decompression uh, of the hematoma if you, if you need time to, to do the suture? Or how long does it take for you to, to start this suture? It's not clear to me. Yeah, actually, you, you can choose uh, 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 to, to uh, uh, in cases that uh, we, we think that we need to fastly drain uh, the subdural hematoma, the previous way that I always use is do a slip, multiple slip, because the multiple slip would not allow the brain to hang it. Uh, if, you, if you think that the subdural are too thick, you can do multiple slip before you do a duraplasty. Uh, the good thing is with the subdural uh, hematoma is there, you do not need to be very careful when you want to suture the fascia to the dura, because there's always a hematoma in between. So you need not to worry so much that you may hit the brain surface. So there is advantage uh, that you can do even faster than the usual you do for elective cases. So, but if you worry that the subdural may be very thick, you can actually do a, a multiple dura slit before I do do a dura plastic. Uh, my only worry is because most of the time when we we are we are, we are happily take up the clot and, and the brain will be suddenly swollen and we cannot protect the brain, especially the, around the, the herniating uh, edges. Uh, uh, but but there are certain school of thought that uh, telling us we do not need to do a proper dura plastic in trauma. Uh, still, now I still don't believe that that, uh, that uh, advice. I always do a proper duraplasty even in trauma surgery. Thank you. I have one question. Yeah, Prof. Yeah, um, like in uh, trauma surgery, uh, 
do you prefer suturing the complete uh, dura or you just lay the graft and leave it because in trauma the brain is already swollen so the csf leak it's quite uncommon in subdural hematoma because of the brain swelling so leaving the graft and then suturing the skin uh, it will also save the time and uh, it will also save the uh, unnecessary suturing of the graft to the dura i think you can opt for stay suture only to prevent the uh, migration of graft yeah uh, uh, in my opinion uh, dura healing we take at least one month my 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 observation and uh, and uh, usually brain edema in trauma we only last for about five days and if you and in good cases that a good uh, outcome uh, usually you don't see the brain edema to exist uh, beyond five days and and then uh, you get a lot of action uh, due to uh, uh, improper dura closure uh, i find that uh, it's not harmful uh, to do a proper uroplasty. Uh, one thing is good uh, also when you plan to do a, a, a cranioplasty later, uh, you will find the proper plan uh, to open. And uh, very importantly, if you can avoid any CSF or dura tear uh, during the cranioplasty, uh, then a lot of complication can be avoided. But again, depends on uh, how much time do you have in, in the surgery itself. And uh, uh, depends. Uh, I used to do uh, uh, interrupted uh, uh, dura closure because you doesn't need to do a very uh, tight closure in actual sense in trauma. Uh, so uh, that can save a lot of time. Thank you. And uh, one thing is, uh, like, how do you choose a shunt trajectory uh, when you are opting for shunt? Okay, uh, a shunt. Uh, uh, we we, we I, I still use the posterior approach uh, from the. Uh, 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 a keen point uh, where you put a vital hospital uh, shunt. Uh, the only thing, the, the big, biggest issue is uh, uh, whether can we aim at the trigon. Uh, that's the uh, main thing. But uh, if you don't land in trigon, you land anywhere in posterior structure, it can be always uh, uh, blocked by uh, a crawler plexus. Uh, but now, nowadays, we, we tend to try to put all the way uh, to the frontal the frontal horn uh, as much as possible to the ipsy lateral uh, position. Uh, that's where I find the stillet become very important because you don't just put a, a, a stillet up to three centimeter before or four centimeter before you meet the ventricle. I tend to push deeper, uh, probably up to five to six centimeters. Push in freely. Uh, that will help you to aim uh, to the frontal uh, position. And I find the, the risk uh, or the need to uh, revise the shunt due to the cloid plexus is much lower by putting the ventricular tip in the anterior. But having said that, I still believe that the shunt are not perfect. Uh, even whatever you have done, uh, shunt failure usually will come, especially in the pediatric case, or after five years, they will come again uh, with shunt blockage or uh, suboptimal or malfunction. So I still do not know uh, why why it happened yeah, thank you like uh, one one point i was uh, i want to raise and how do you measure the length of the shunt like uh, the shunt ventricular end it's around 15 centimeter long so how do you decide that how much should be put in the ventricle 10 12 centimeter yeah uh, usually i will i will just uh, uh, based on a rough estimation from a ct ct scan uh, where I will measure from the uh, entry point uh, mm -hmm. up to the <coughs> trigon and, uh, and another measurement up to the Monroe, beyond the Monroe. So it's just a rough estimation. And, and uh, we, we can't be very exact because it's, it, we are not measuring in the 3D. So that is mm -hmm. uh, how I usually measure. Yes, uh, I want to add one point also. Uh, yeah. You are right in this. And there is one thing is that you can measure the skull length, two thirds of this uh, whole length, the mm -hmm. ventricle end should be this much long. So okay. that's how you can decide. And also uh, best estimation is uh, using the scale and on the CT uh, yeah. and then measuring the length from the outer part of the bone. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how you can get the, because if you want to put the tip in the frontal horn, mm -hmm. then you need to measure the correct length. Yeah, correct. As much as possible, because yeah. otherwise the shunt will be either shorter or it will be going beyond the frontal horn. Yeah. 
and uh, the, uh, another uh, on the same side shunt because uh, uh, how do you define the angle because when you are putting the shunt uh, the uh, you, the child is, uh, the person is in the uh, lateral uh, head is turned and so how do you decide that uh, you are going uh, correctly not laterally or not too medially yeah. uh, i i i uh... I think the again the, uh, is is a, uh, not not a very easy. That's why there's many paper who start showing different way. Uh, I remember I saw one paper from India where they use the brighter eminence as the guide, uh, the best because uh, majority of cases the shun was placed too anteriorly rather than too posteriorly, and and uh, that is the main problem. And uh, usually it's very easy for you to understand to know that. Uh, uh, in in most shun cases, if we get the CSF within the first four centimeter, if you tend to put deeper than that, you know that you are already wrong location. So that is first guide, first first clue. Second clue is uh, you need to push in slightly beyond the trigon uh, before you you uh, you try to angulate your shun. And because again, stilet is strict, is not in angulated form. So you can only use stilet partial in your in your uh, ventricular catheter insertion. And the, the next part, you need to let it flow, uh, push in uh, along the ventricular wall, and just that hopefully it not stuck anywhere because it's a soft tube anyway. That, that's how uh, the, the usual way that I look at it. Agree. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Liu. Thank you so much. Yeah. Doctor Liu, thank you very much for a nice presentation. And just I want to uh, can can you hear? Yes. Looks like you. So uh, the for the severe, severe head yeah, injury yeah. case. Yes. So yes. yeah. So how how you can yes. estimate how you can evaluate the cognitive function of the patient or how you can tell uh, the the future the condition of the brain. Yeah. So yeah. Do you do you do something for uh, that detection? Yeah, actually, actually, over years, uh, I, I do in my master, I do a paper on uh, head injury. Uh, I find the uh, even the current management of head injury uh, is very superficial. It's very limited to just uh, intracranial pressure uh, monitoring, which I find that because we are only treating uh, uh, brain injury with intracerebral hemorrhage, intracranial. And the pressure, but we forgot about the diffuse uh, exonal injury and also diffuse vascular injury. It always come together in, with severe head injury. That's why in certain cases that uh, despite we, we find that we have done very good uh, surgery, the compressive surgery, the ICP is well controlled, uh, but eventually we found that there's a lot of brain atrophy after that. Uh, and I, I believe that uh, this is due to dysfunction of the, of the, uh, fun of the brain, the uh, injured brain. And, and uh, because of that, uh, we have not actually, at the, this moment, as far as I understand, we have not come to the extent that we, we have enough therapy to treat uh, what were injury to the brain. And we, we always concentrate that the primary brain injury is a single event. And by avoiding secondary brain injury, like hypoxia and hypotension is good enough, which I think is not right. I think a primary brain injury, again, is a sequence of event, a cascade of event that will happen after that. So how much have been no understanding uh, that we can stop the, the cascade due to the, the primary injury? I think there's still a lot to be known. And, and also, I, I, over the years, I find that uh, it may not be too bad if we fail to treat a very severe head injury patient. But uh, I do find that even a mild head injury and uh, more, or even a mild head injury and moderate head injury, we have neglected them so much. And most of them have some connective uh, follow up, uh, especially those with mild head injury and, 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 and uh, cause uh, uh, disruption in their uh, social and also in their work. I, I still do not have a good answer to you, Professor, but I still feel that the, the uh, development in terms of treatment and therapy for head injury is still very superficial and we still a lot of things that we do not know in head injury. Maybe you can, uh, you can maybe do some functional the image analysis, uh, I think, uh, if it is uh, not so difficult for everyone, uh, so I think uh, it's a good uh, method. It just you can uh, prognosis, make a prognosis for the, the yeah. patient. Thank you. Very good presentation.
because for for trauma, if you want to request for a MRI for a patient, the radiology we say no, no. <laughs> so very hard to do studies. Yes. I have also one uh, question and one comment for Dr. Liu. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. These, those are things which we are we have all every, every day with our patients. Regarding decompressive craniectomy, uh, when do you uh, make cranioplasty after how long you uh, wait, three months, six months, how long you wait for the cranioplasty after the compressive craniectomy? Uh, in my personal opinion, we actually doesn't need to wait long. As I mentioned earlier, brain edema only lasts for the first five days, almost one week. So you can actually do any time after that. But again, uh, depend on how confident are you that the patient will not uh, fall into uh, uh, infection. Uh, more, more worrying if you do an early cranioplasty, if a patient have uh, underlying infection, they have not been settling. So if you're very clear that the patient uh, do not have any parameters to suggest any infection, I think even the, the bone flap can be even replaced within the first two weeks. Okay, so that's why we you should... Must always remember the, the decompressed craniotomy only for the moment where maximum brain edema to be expected. And there's no reason to put longer. Hmm. We changed our strategy, actually. But we... in, in practice, we... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I was interrupting you. Finish, please, please finish. Yeah, yeah, okay. can we continue, Adi? Yeah. Uh, we, we changed our strategy. We perform now uh, hinge craniotomy. So we cut the bone flap out in two parts and the upper part, we fix it by the hinge sutures and the lower part where we perform the uh, me, uh, medial fossa, we remove part of the medial fossa uh, lateral part and the uh, uh, basal part, so we don't put that bone back. So we uh, actually, by this technique, we avoid second surgery. And on the uh, basal part, especially in the older patients, this basal part is covered by the temporal muscle. And also we use temporal fascia for, for duraplasty. So uh, I think, uh, and we had one study in 100 patients, uh, we compared the results of our DC and hinge craniotomy and the uh, results are, are quite similar in, in, in the decompressive manner because the, usually the proximal part of the bone, it's not a big problem. The biggest problem is the temporal part because it's uh, because of the herniation to the uh, basal trunk. So that's why we, we perform hinge craniotomy in this in the last couple of years, especially in older patients. Thank you. Thank you, Adi. Nice meeting you here, Adi. <laughs> uh, you too, you too. Yeah, I have a question, can I? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Sandeep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so for uh, subacute subdural hematoma or chronic subdural hematoma, how many bar holes do you place, one bar hole? or two bar holes and do you irrigate the subdural cavity with saline or uh, you don't irrigate the su subdural cavity yeah what's uh, your strategy actually frank yes i tend to do two before one in frontal one in brightal and i always irrigate from frontal to brighter let it drain as much as possible and subsequently i will close uh, one before fill up the water before i close another before to avoid uh, any more cephalus uh, the only risk for this uh, process find that uh, by doing this procedure, the risk of infection is slightly higher uh, by doing a tuber four. Otherwise, the other complications are almost the same. Uh, but again, this technique or even a single burrow technique would not be so successful if you see the laminated type, I mean, there's a lot of membrane formation. Uh, so in those cases, if you want to be, uh, because the brain cannot be shifted back, and once the, the, the brain cannot be shifted back, uh, there will always a potential that may be collected there and uh, it, it will cause uh, re-accumulation. Re and in those cases where you think that probably a, a pseudo membrane there, I will always try to perform a mini uh, cranial, craniotomy uh, to able to open up uh, all the spaces to enable to drain. But in current practice, in generally, most of the sub-acute uh, sub drain, uh, I would suggest to prefer single before at the most dependent area and do not allow the CF uh, blood to drain out excessively, uh, immediately put in the drain. A lot of people think that by not diluting the blood, the blood will not flow out 
through the subdural uh, drain, which I think is not true. Uh, I think uh, blood usually in the subacute stage uh, usually can drain through the, the, the catheter. That practice in just finger or uh, immediate put in the uh, uh, subdural drain without any irrigation. Yeah, I, mean, I uh, always hit yeah. my tear from you. Yeah. Yeah, a one bar hole or single bar hole irrigation or no irrigation is still a controversial subject. Uh, what we follow actually is two bar hole technique and we irrigate with saline and we we put the vacuum drain in a subgalial plane covering the both bar holes. We don't put it intracranially to avoid the risk of injury to brain or any bridging veins or any veins. We put it in a subgalial plane and we yeah. put it at maximum suction. So we have seen similar results and uh, with less risk of injury to brain as yeah. shown by you in one of your cases. Yeah. And uh, also as uh, said by you, if we see uh, thick membrane, we also do a mini craniotomy and try to excise the membrane mm -hmm. and coagulate the edges of the membrane. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. I think uh, we have a we had a very nice discussion about this uh, interesting topic, right? Issue. I think uh, yes. this second talk uh, uh, is very very useful for young neurosurgeons and not just young neurosurgeons. I think many tricks uh, are important. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Liu, for your nice uh, nice talk. Thank you, Professor. Okay, th so I think uh, we have to uh, close uh, this meeting now. Uh, thank you very much for uh, presenting and for uh, uh, joining uh, the meeting. I don't know if uh, Professor Yoko Kato wants to uh, say something in the closure. I, I missed uh, uh, Dr. Musara from Zimbabwe because uh, we want to have a uh, one word uh, from him, but he. I think he left already. I think, uh, I think uh, he is here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you should say something, please. From Africa, representative Africa, please. Uh, well, it, it, thank you uh, so much for the great uh, presentations, which I've enjoyed so much. Um, it's a good uh, learning moment. Um, not too many colleagues to interact with in as much as. Uh, you can have in this uh, forum uh, down here, but, but um, th this is good. So you, you can have the test of elsewhere as well. Thank you so much. So what, Thank what you. About, what about condition in Africa now? Is it is it okay? Um, COVID, yes, it, it had uh, it come down, but we, we, with, with the reopening of schools, we are seeing a new surge again, uh, which we wish seems to be emanating from schools. Okay, from next time, you, you should bring your colleagues for the, the alumni meeting, please. That's okay, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, we, we wish more colleagues from Africa. Uh, can join our association and our meetings in the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you uh, to all of you. Thank you, Professor Cato. Thank you, uh, Professor Di Rocco and uh, Dr. Liu uh, for nice presentations. Um, thank you, Ishu, my co-moderator in, uh, in this webinar, as usual. Uh, thank you uh, to all of you uh, who joined this meeting and okay, have a nice uh, Sunday uh, and a nice week ahead. See you next time.